Big cut job to half an hour. Stay well. Keep warm. Get some TLC. Yeah, so I'm going to have a look today at um, this fucking strange, another strange fucker called Pope fucking Francis. A weirdo. Yeah. And all, all the fuckery behind his uh, ignore, ignore, taff. Put your teeth in, bro. Inaug inauguration? Inauguration? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got there. Let me just get rid of that. Yeah, that, I, I'm telling you now, it, like, she was saying, right, like Dan, Dan's comment about the 13-year-old girl and the tits or whatever, yeah, right? And um, she first came up and said that well, I didn't know. She, I thought he, he said she was 30. I could have sworn he said, he said well, we, we wouldn't be talking about it if, if she was fucking 30 years old. Do you know what I mean? At the end of the day. Yeah? And then, and, then, and then she turned around then on the same breath and said, oh, well, it's not my place to judge. It's not my place. Do you know what I mean? Well, well don't comment. And then she was 30 then, and then you're going to wind up people like, do you know what I mean? Some fucking idiot out in America, devil worshipping, blowing up fucking Satan's pianos like. Fucking, she's a wrong one, but she's a proper wrong one. I'm telling you now, she's wanting to watch that DQ. She's fucking wrong one. And fucking, what an ugly bitch. What an ugly fucking bitch. And it wouldn't, and, and even, if, even if she was pretty, right? Her personality, oh, it's, it's, it's oh, she, she fucking make my skin crawl. She make my skin crawl. She's like, she's a girl, and I punch her straight in the jaw. Punch her straight in the jaw. Gone with you. Be gone with you, fucking witch. She, she's, um, she thinks she's a, like a, one of them, I don't know if you guys know Lilith, like whoever you're the Lilith. It was like um, Adam's, Adam and Eve type of thing. Um, it was the woman before Eve, Lilith. And she didn't run it because she didn't want to get fucked or Adam just wanted to poke her all the time, but she didn't want none of it. So she escaped and then got poked then by, by um, like demons or, uh, and she gave birth to su Succubus and Incubus. Succubus and Incubus. And um, she, f I, she, she, she thinks she's one of them. Like she thinks she's one of them. She fucking demanded, absolutely fucking demanded. Anyway. I'm glad she's over the pond, far away, far away, you know, yeah. Anybody back in that fat cunt in uh, Bedford, it, it needs to have their head fucking check wobbled. Fact. Fact. Anyway, big day today, guys in the rugby. England versus Wales at the fucking Principality in Wales. Fucking come on. You know what I mean? Yeah. I might make you feel a bit better. We stuffy M English today, Violet, eh? Come on. That's what we got fucking left out of this Six Nations, to be fair. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. I love you, English. Don't get it wrong. Don't get it twisted. But, uh, yeah, as long as we beat the English, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. So let's get into this, guys. Tringlo. 
sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Well, you can shove your fucking chariots up your ass. You can shove your fucking chariots up your ass. You can shove your fucking chariots. Shove your fucking chariots. Big up, Kamla. Shove your fucking chariots up your ass. Yeah, I think you got uh, Island Go. You playing? You playing today? You got France today? Yeah, Cam. Is it? Or is it? Or is it Scotland got France today? I'm not sure. I'm only concerned with one fucking venue, one fixture. So let's get into this. About this fucking wrong and called Pope fucking Francis. And I'll look into this little fucking bitch. It's a fine, fine, fine. Because we were born. Born to be alive. Oh, thanks, Cam. Thanks, Cam. We've got to take something out of this Six Nations, haven't we, eh? Got to take something. Otherwise, we got a wooden spoon. I got a fucking wooden spoon. Uh, I've had a couple in my lifetime. You know what I mean? I think you, I think you Irish, will win it, win it hands down. I do, Cam. You're fucking brilliant side. Fantastic fucking rugby side island at the moment. Got to give it credit where it's due. Give it credit where it's due. Okay. Get your popcorn out. Let's have a listen. The Hope Roman the, Catholic Church was in the... Let's hope the uh, YouTube gods don't fucking... Uh, straight down the taff. ...throes of a grave crisis. Pope Benedict had just stepped down, and a desperate search for his successor was on. It led to a city more than 11,000 kilometers away. Is there is fervent faith and tango? Is the audio the good, guys? All, all good? All good, all good. Thousands of Argentinians crowded into Plaza de Mayo, Big the theatre of the I'll nation's great that. political moments. On the other side of the world, a momentous religious event was unfolding in St. Peter's Square in Rome. It was the inauguration of Pope Francis, spiritual leader of 1.2 billion Roman Catholics worldwide. Jorge Mario Bergoglio, the first non-European to occupy the papal throne in 1300 years, the first Jesuit to become Pope, and, as an Argentinian, indeed the first Latin American. It was a turning point in the 2000-year history of the Church. A month earlier, ominous storm clouds gathered over St. Peter's Square. For the first time in 600 years, a pope had resigned. Those actors, plena libertate di claro, me ministerio episcopi Rome, successore Sancti Peti, vi permanus cardinalium, di undivicissimo aprilis bis millesimo quinto commissum, renunciare Right there. Well, I uh, turned on the news at six in the morning in Chicago on Monday after I had seen him on Thursday and came back on Sunday to Chicago and Monday morning I heard on the news that he was resigning. I had a hard time uh, no, adjusting a, to he's it. He's wrong on that. Il Santo Padre, eh, eh, the Holy Father is a man who made his choice freely at a time when he felt he didn't have the strength to serve the church. Sentiva che mancavano le forze per servire la chiesa. 
His act is an act of great courage, great humility, and above all, an act of great love for the Church. The shocked faithful speculated about why Pope Benedict had resigned. His last year as spiritual leader of Roman Catholics worldwide had been especially challenging, with scandals involving the Vatican Bank, paedophiles, and the Vatican government. Wrong ends. The courier. Rocky wrong ends. Slaughter you. I think uh, he's a sincere and honest man, and that's what he just felt that that's what he ought to do. Nobody was influencing him. Rocky wrong ends. In fact, I think. Apologist. I don't think anybody knew. Uh, I know the, the, the former Cardinal Secretary of State, Cardinal Sedano, only knew the night before. Uh, so I think it was a totally free decision. Gianluigi Nuzzi is the Italian journalist who published papers stolen from Pope Benedict's apartment that spoke of corruption and blackmail in the Vatican. The Pope's butler, Paolo Gabriele, was later found guilty of leaking the papers. Spot on, Count. Then Spot on, by Pope Benedict. In the last year, we have seen two unexpected events regarding people in the church. One was the mouse. papal renunciation, which was unexpected, and another event that was unpredictable. Mouse, I heard you was a female. <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not. And I, it's talk, it's talk. Was that the butler of this person made these documents public for the good of the church and the good of the pope. One of the scandals involved the Vatican Bank, infamous for its lack of transparency. In early 2012, the bank was investigated for breaking money laundering laws, and its president, Ettore Gotti Tedeschi, forced to resign. We have a president of the Vatican Bank who resigned because he said, I'm afraid of being killed. That's what he wrote. He told his secretary, if I die, give these documents to these three people. And he indicated a journalist, an historian, and a friend. There were even rumors of a murder plot against the Pope himself. Cardinal Dario Castrillon Hoyos received a report from China predicting Benedict's death within 12 months. The secret police recorded what was said, and they gave me this document, and I handed it over to the Holy Father personally. Holy Father! Right, there's, there's the alarm bells, there's the alarm bells ringing. Yeah, there's only one father, yeah, and, it, and this fucking wrong and is calling himself a father. He's no way the fucking father, he's a fucking wrong one. Benedict's greatest challenge was responding to the pedophilia should never be scandals. claiming himself as the father, well, holy no father. That the child sex abuse scandal remains an open wound, and, and not just for the church in the United States, but I think for the church everywhere. Now, of course, the church in the United States has been dealing with this for a little longer. You know, our crisis really erupted in, in late 2002. Uh, and so the American church has been dealing with it for more than a decade, which I think makes our bishops and our cardinals even more sensitive. The difficulty with the scandals is that uh, every time old history is brought forward, something happened 20 years ago, it happened yesterday. And so people came to think, oh, it's still going on. Benedict the 16th said, turn to the civil justice system for pedophilia. And we saw how it all ended. Wrong I think that in the Los Angeles Diocese it's alone, wrong they paid $650 million in damages to pedophilia victims. And it's a terrible scandal. I mean, it should never have happened. Six hundred million dollars. Stay with it because we have to stay with the. But uh, in terms of handling it, it's not a, it's not an issue that's. Oh, been internet. Benedict internet. ordered an investigation into the scandal. Fuck you up, internet. A report was delivered in December 2012. The mysterious content. to his successor. Fuck this, internet. let's say, is the content, and he con...
And I go fucking nuts now. Sorry, guys. My fucking internet. In itself, very significant. Eh, insiste su molto significativa. For him, 85, 86, getting feebler. Uh, and he had been with Pope John Paul the last years of his life when really he could do nothing. And there were a lot of cardinals I knew who thought maybe he should resign, you know, he, after 2000, year 2000. And I, uh, I saw him once or twice then, and uh, certainly he wasn't capable of, of, uh, of ruling the church. Benedict chose to spend the rest of his life here, within the Vatican walls, but in did. this convent specially restored as his new living quarters. Look at that. Hey, hey, hey. As the day of his departure, it's a golf buggy, isn't it? his last appearances oh, did golf little buggy, to lift buy. the veil of mystery over why he stepped down. On the 28th of February 2013, Benedict left the Vatican to take up temporary residence at Castel Gandolfo, the papal summer palace. Cardinal Bertone, the Vatican's Secretary of State and all-powerful administrator, locked and sealed the doors to the pontiff's apartments and declared the throne vacant. The cardinals of the Catholic Church soon descended on Rome to elect a new pope and confront the institution's worst crisis in decades. In Buenos Aires, Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio, known for his humble lifestyle, took the metro homewards to prepare for his trip to Rome. The sound of his favorite music filled the air as Argentine goed the night away, unaware that the world spotlight oh, again. soon returned upon Not again! Them. They with me, oh, fucking, fucking that snow. Pope Benedict appeared in public for the last time in Castel Gandolfo, where he saluted the crowds before retreating from the Vatican stage. <laughs> Oh, no, no, the juju's are out to get me, you know. Somebody don't want me to play this video today.
Eh? The juju's out on me. I fucking renounce you all. Get out of my house. In the name of Jesus. You bastards. On your way. Did the bookmakers. That should do it. Pope Bedding, you know, let us not forget. It goes back to 500 years. It's old as the conclave itself. You know, back in 1513, so 500 years ago, um, they were betting on, on the, uh, the conclave around Leo X. The, the big um, banks were, were running the sort of books between them, and they had sort of minions scurrying between the two with the updated odds. So we're not doing anything new here. Members of a victim's association, the survivor's network of those abused by priests, also arrived in Rome to make their voices heard. Until we see the Pope um, defrocking bad bishops, and until we see the secular justice system jailing bad bishops, then things aren't going to change. And, and this isn't about being punitive. This is about deterring the cover-ups of child sex crimes. A remarkably open discussion focused on some thorny issues, such as whether some cardinals in the conclave had covered up abuse. Yet another scandal hit the headlines. Cardinal Keith O'Brien, Archbishop of Edinburgh, resigned after admitting inappropriate sexual behavior towards young priests. Wrong I believe that Cardinal O'Brien has released a declaration on his own behalf in Scotland. At least I see that it is being talked about. This is of another jurisdiction. As far as we are concerned, we have the acceptance by the Holy Father of the resignation of the government of the Diocese of Edinburgh. The U.S. cardinals broke with tradition and began holding their own press conferences every day after the congregation of cardinals. The courier later asked them to stop. However, the North American college remained a powerhouse for change. In the old days, the idea was you can't have an American pope because that would be a superpower pope. And, you know, America already has too much power and everybody would think the CIA was, had taken control of the Vatican and so on. But, you know, these days, America is no longer the only superpower in the world. Uh, the, the calculus has changed. Finally, a conclave date was set for March the 12th. As each cardinal, as Omar says, sex case, sex case, I am, I am, I am. Is also the parish priest of a church in Rome. One. They all went to their parishes in the city to say mass. It was their last campaign push. Austrian cardinal Christoph Schönborn of Vienna even held his own press conference. That's what man in in from Franciscus said. That there must. As St. Francis said, but of course St. Francis did not become Pope, he did not want to. What we're looking for is a man of the Gospel. This, I believe, is the deciding question. Look at it! Look at it! Look at that! On the morning of March the 12th, 180 cardinals celebrated a Mass to pray that all would go well in the conclave about to commence. Under heavy rain and dark skies, 115 cardinal electors wrong and 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 all the way up. Entered the Sistine Chapel to a litany of saints. They swore an oath of secrecy. Them jokers with the fucking multicolored. The doors were ceremoniously closed. Jokers. Two thirds of the 115 cardinals would have to agree in order to elect a new pope. Speculation over who would get the 77 votes required was feverish. We'll look at their strengths and their experiences, things like what country they're from, um, the policy that they've headed up, um, where they sit in the church, obviously their, their, their um, theological views. Do they have a, an active Twitter following? Um, it's almost a pre prerequisite these days. And then from there, we let the market decide. Archbishop of Milan, Angelo Scola, was the front runner. As Archbishop of the world's largest diocese and former Patriarch of Venice, he was seen as the man who could reform the church from the inside. Angelo Scola is well known, especially in Italy. He is close to the theology of Joseph Ratzinger. Scola started off about 15 to 1 in the betting. He was quickly cut to about 2 or 3 uh, to 1 after we saw a lot of money for him. 
take someone like um, Cardinal, um, Cardinal Renzi from Nigeria, started off, you know, one of the front runners, two to three to one, um, quickly moved out to sort of 50 to one after we didn't see much money on him. There are many who have pointed to Cardinal Timothy Dolan of New York, who is this kind of media savvy freak of nature uh, as one possibility. Uh, some have talked about Cardinal Sean O'Malley of Boston, who is a profiler on the sexual abuse scandals that have been such a cancer for the Catholic Church. Those who expected a Latin American pope saw a potential leader in Odilo Scherer, Archbishop of Sao Paulo in Brazil. It seems that during the congregations before the conclave, Cardinal Scherer defended the workings of the Roman Curia, as opposed to the other cardinals who criticized the Roman Curia. We hope that the next pope will have Mexico and the whole of Latin America in his heart. As the faithful and the curious descended on Rome, a circus-like atmosphere permeated St. Peter's Square. It would be very nice, I think, if the new Pope be like Francis I, or Francis, both in name and in his approach and the things he does, following his teaching. Inside the conclave, Tension was mounting as the ballots came and went. You'd ask, well, what do you think, etc. So you never ask people how you vote, but who do you think would be a strong... Or you ask somebody about somebody else. You do that quite often. You ask a Brazilian, what do you know about Cardinal, you know, Scherer? You ask, uh, I ask Cardinal Kerlick, who's a Hiya, rubs. retired now in Paraná in Argentina. Rubs. What about <laughs> rubs. All over the world, men and women prayed for a pope who could address the many different challenges facing the church. When you reach 77, then you know you have elected a pope. Whether he'll accept is another question. But uh, uh, that's a moment when everybody, you can just hear a kind of collective sigh of relief. <laughs> and, uh, people applauded. And then they finish the tally, of course, they must. I think the election of a pope is extraordinary, it's quick. You know, the death of one pope or the resignation of a pope, within a fortnight, three weeks, you've got a new one. It's pretty quick. When you think of uh, elections in, in countries, you know, they go on and on. In the, in the United States or... Got to keep the money rolling Germany, in, bro, I'm you now. They're, they're yeah. for months. Got to keep your he belly fat. in white. And then we all listen to the protodeacon of the that money rolling in. facing that uh, great mural of the Last Judgment. Uh, when Christ returns in glory to judge the living and the dead, and the Pope is there and he's listening to the... The maddest thing is, guys, and you know I speak my mind, in it, right? The oldest of oldest, these fucking guys and I, all these are going to hell. All these are being hell. If you ever have the displeasure of uh, going to hell, and it is a proper place, you'll see all these people in there. All of them. Fact. The uh, 16th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, where he hears the words, Jesus telling Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And you know, only 266 men have ever heard those words directed to them personally. We really want to see those fingers. Finally, white smoke signaled that the cardinals had reached the two-thirds quorum and chosen their man. Bells rang across Rome. And quickly, St. Peter's Square, filmed with a large crowd, gathered. If I remember rightly as well, guys, didn't lightning strike the top of the the Vatican Church? Didn't lightning strike it? As he got a fucking ignore... I can't... Don't quote me on that. I might just, just be thinking. ...to hear the news. The proto-deacon stepped out onto the balcony to announce the new Pope's name in Latin. Sex kiss, sex kiss, hang him, hang him, hang him. Mario Bergoglio was the Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires and had been the runner-up to Joseph Ratzinger in the previous conclave. It was the first time in a thousand years that a non-European had been elected as the leader of the Roman Catholic Church. 
and the first time a Jesuit had been elevated to the office. It signaled radical change. The, the choice uh, was, I think, uh, one that we took a long time to discern, trying to do what God wants for the church. And sometimes in the reports, people assume motivations based upon geography, where you're from, based upon ideology. Uh, but those uh, don't play a large role. I didn't have in my mind this man, Pope Francis. And I don't think any of the other cardinals, or at least very few of them, did. And it was during uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the congregations, they call them, the meetings that took place at the cardinals, all the cardinals, <coughs> for nearly a week. I think that gradually you could see the, the, the portrait of, of, of someone. And, and, and I think it, it, it centered eventually on this man they hadn't thought of. His adopted name, Pope Francis, was inspired by St. Francis of Assisi, defender of the poor and downtrodden. The message to the world was clear. White smoke billowing Kermit. from a copper chimney was a sign to the world that one of its most powerful leaders had been chosen in the secrecy of the Sistine Chapel. The Cardinal's choice fell on Jorge Mario Bergoglio, the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. The enthusiastic crowd celebrated the new pope, even though his election had come as a surprise to all. Carolina Barros is the editor of the Buenos Aires Herald and has followed Cardinal Bergoglio's career. He didn't expect to be elected pope if you look at the way he bought his ticket. He had a, a full trip ticket and he was meant to be back on, on the 23rd. He'll be staying in Rome forever. The future Pope Francis grew up in this middle-class suburb of Buenos Aires called Flores, more than 11,000 kilometers away from Rome. Now almost completely rebuilt, this is the house where he was brought up by a family of Italian immigrants. Just round the corner is his primary school. Nuestra Señora de la Misericordia was his middle school. And these were the places he played and prayed as a devout Catholic boy. Here he played football when he was a small boy, five years old. Then he played football. When he was bigger, he played football with his friends in the square. Played with a couple of balls, I suspect. He was a vivacious child, known for his special charm. There was another sister who died at 110 years of age, and he'd ask, what was I like when I was a kid? And she'd answer, a little Dirty devil. Little cunt. The sister was wonderful. She was immensely attached to him. He was a devout boy, and it is reported that when one of his lungs had to be removed due to a serious infection, he found strength in his faith. He entered the Jesuit seminary aged 20, studied chemistry, and became a priest at 33. The Jesuits are one of the most powerful religious orders in the Catholic Church, and he was appointed their superior in Argentina, aged just 37. Society of Jesus has been traditionally and a long history very, very politically minded, and they know how to deal with with politics and power. Archbishop Bergoglio worked closely with Father Gustavo Carrara, a Jesuit engaged in frontline missionary work in the slums of Buenos Aires. The priests, courageous priests, worked in this area during the dictatorship, pushing forward community creation. Today, our work moves forward in the same spirit. Although the challenges are very different today, because now these areas... I agree, I agree, Kermit, lad. But um, what I don't like about this Pope Francis, he wants to be known as... He wants people to address him as the father. He wants to be addressed as the father. He's claiming... He's claiming God's name. And he's making these acts, yeah, about this, this um, same-sex marriage. 
um, in, in, in the Father's name. He, I, he's literally pointing at himself like Jesus is on his right type of thing. He's the Father, like literally God. And the end, they're just vessels. They're just vessels for God. And it's fucking, they're dirty little vessels too. Dirty little fucking smelly little vessels. And all they're interested in is filling their bellies and how much gold they can fucking get hanging from their necks uh, for the Vatican City. Fucking wrong ones, a lot of them. Areas are more structured than before. And our idea is how do we integrate these areas into the wider city? In 1976, a military junta seized power and proceeded to kidnap and murder thousands of people. Among them, those who preached the gospel as a manifesto of social justice. The actions of the Roman Catholic leadership during the so-called Dirty War are the subject of heated criticism. Dirty War! Some Dirty War! Some directly <laughs> at Jorge Bergoglio. Make it up. As head of the Jesuits in Argentina, he was responsible for two priests who were kidnapped in the Bajo Flores slum in Buenos Aires. Their story is intimately connected with the tragic death of Monica Mignone, a devout Catholic teacher and volunteer who worked with them. Mercedes Mignone is her sister. On the 14th of May, 1976, about five in the morning, the bell began ringing insistently. They were from the armed forces. They told Monica to get dressed. They told her not to take any money, that they had come to collect her to answer some questions about a friend of hers, and that two hours later she would come back. Fathers Francisco Jalix and Orlando Jorio were Jesuit priests who worked with Monica. They were kidnapped a week later in the shanty towns where the destitute of Buenos Aires lived and where urban guerrillas found refuge. Then, more or less a week later, they went to the slum of Bajo Flores, and there they took away two priests, Shalix and Shorio, and a group of catechism teachers. Monica's father was determined to find out what had happened to her. He discovered that she and the priests had been taken to this detention center the infamous School for Naval Mechanics, or ESMA, where dozens of detainees died under the dictatorship. When my father found out what the situation was, also with Shalix and Shorio, Montes, who was a member of the military at the time, said, oh, but it's the Navy that has them. And a few days later, the two priests reappeared. And we think that in this case, in this situation, the fact that our father found out has a lot to do with the fact that they were freed. Jorge Bergoglio, however, says it was he who intervened with high-ranking Admiral Emilio Macera to have them released. He testified to this effect before an inquest in 2005. Bueno, mire, Macera, yo quiero que aparezcan. Me levanté y me fui. What happened to these two Jesuit priests, seen here saying mass with their superior, Bergoglio, is at the heart of the criticism leveled at the new pope by one of Argentina's leading journalists, Horacio Verbitsky. This is a document which, in 1979, Bergoglio delivered to the government of the dictatorship asking for the renewal of Jalik's passport. In this second document is the recommendation of the official who received it, rejecting the request. Although these documents are not signed by Jorge Bergoglio himself, the government official claims that his decision was based on Bergoglio's reports. In the third document, the same official with the same signature explains what the reasons are, and they are exactly the same as what Jalex and Giorgio said Bergoglio was saying about them. Subversive activity in female religious institutes, conflicts of obedience, 
Detainment in the Navy School for Mechanics. They weren't detained, they were kidnapped, which is not the same. He was accused with Father Giorgio of suspected contact with guerrillas. These documents were delivered to us by Father Bergoglio himself. 30,000 young men and women were kidnapped, tortured, and murdered during Argentina's dirty war. Human rights campaigner Emilio Mignone would discover just how ambiguous the church hierarchy was. This is my mother, Angelica Sosa de Mignone and Nora Portinas. They went to ask the Pope what had happened to their children. But the church, or rather the hierarchy of the church, did nothing. La iglesia nunca... O sea, la jerarquía de la iglesia nunca se ocupó. Shortly after Jorge Bergoglio's election as Pope, Father Jalix released a statement saying he had no further comment on Bergoglio's role in this matter. Some say Bergoglio's silent diplomacy may have actually saved lives, but not everyone is convinced. The grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo are among his critics. They are still searching for 400 children born in captivity. Complicity is either by action or by omission. There were those who acted openly and straightforwardly in favor of the dictatorship, such as the bishop, and there are those who looked the other way and did nothing and did not help us, and that was by omission. They have responsibility. Because up to this point, Monsignor Bergoglio has said nothing about the desaparecidos. De los desaparecidos. Monica Mignone never returned. The grandmothers of Plaza de Maggio, meanwhile, have successfully identified 108 grandchildren born in captivity who were placed in foster homes but have since been reintroduced to their biological families. We estimate that around 30,000 people were kidnapped during the dictatorship, and among them, 500 babies, of whom we have found 108. Now they are grown men and women. 108. That period when the, when the church would go to the slums, but on, but on the other hand, would keep quiet on what was going on was in a way sent to the archives and nobody wanted to talk about that. Jorge Mario Bergoglio thinks that the church should be caring of the poor people. That dedication to the poor is clear here in the very church where Monica Mignone used to work with fathers Jalix and Giorgio. This is where her sister was married. The typical inhabitant of this slum is the laborer, the worker, the woman who wants a better life for her children and has to leave them to work outside the home. The barrio of Bajo Flores is on the southern outskirts of the city. These teenagers are traveling across the city to participate in a special mass for two young men about to enter the local seminary. The celebration is an expression of the fervent popular Catholic culture that thrives here. Many of the inhabitants of the slums are immigrants from neighboring countries, such as Bolivia. They bring with By engaging with the poor of the slums, the Archbishop Jorge Bergoglio came to know intimately the realities of wider Latin America. In the barrio on the other side, they hold the very popular feast of the Virgin of Copacabana, who is the patron saint of Bolivia. And here, there are many people who have immigrated from Bolivia. It's a festivity that attracts more than 30,000 people who come from the different areas of the city and Greater Buenos Aires to venerate the image of the Virgin and dance their native dances. Jorge Bergoglio's opposition to liberation theology 
won him the favor of Pope John Paul II, who first made him Archbishop of Buenos Aires and then a cardinal. He's very straightforward, very authentic, very man of great integrity because he's been pastor when uh, it's been difficult for the church. And so you have to kind of find your way in that. And this is a time of some difficulty for all of us, and so if he can help us find our way, that's uh, one very great uh, help. It will have a big impact on the church and help us all to govern. Jorge Bergoglio's strong connection with the Jewish community in Argentina may contribute to peace in the Middle East, says Augustin Ulyanovsky, leader of the Jewish youth movement in Buenos Aires. The Pope can use his charisma and can use the relations he's developed with the Jewish community in Argentina to open a channel of dialogue, to bring an end to this conflict that is so harmful to everyone. In the earliest hours of March the 19th, 2013, the popular enthusiasm for the first Argentine Pope swept away considerations of the past and the future. Crowds gathered in the Plaza de Maggio. In Rome, thousands massed in St. Peter's Square. The mood was festive. Jorge Bergoglio. you must have somebody. We've had good popes, bad popes, effective popes, ineffective popes, you know, but you have to have a pope. As bishop, Jorge Bergoglio is a great love. communicator, despite not using social media or even a computer. Tough battling the jujus. He doesn't uh, use internet, he doesn't have a, a, a laptop, he writes on an old uh, writing machine. He doesn't tweet, but then he knows, and he said it, the importance of the media in this global world. Pope Francis's quick wit and ability to relate to ordinary people has made him popular. He is very frugal in his eating, very austere, and they say if you're invited to dinner, take something with you, or you'll come away hungry. He has the wit of the people of Buenos Aires. He's open, quick, funny, simpatico, laughs a lot. He's not solemn and not formal. This man's going to have the whole world eating out of his hand. Despite his old-fashioned style, Pope Francis understands the need for more openness with the media. He gave 
the best pieces for, to the media. He gave it out to the media. And at the same time, he said, look, the moment things were getting very, very dramatic, hot, he said, uh, on my side, I had the, bishop, the, the Cardinal of Sao Paulo, Brazil, and he said, you shouldn't forget the poor. And so, the Pope says, the name Francis came to me. The Holy Spirit of God sparked a whole movement, in this case represented by St. Francis of Assisi, which placed the Church in front of the decision to return to the poverty of the Gospel. All that Francis means for I mean, for, not only for, for, for the Catholics, but for the whole world. Everybody knows who Francisco de Assis or Francis of Assisi is. And the, the saint that believed in going back to basics and to nature and uh, the environment. During his first sermon, on the day of his inauguration in Rome, Pope Francis established the guiding values of his papacy. The church and humanity, he said, are the custodians of the created universe, and Wales! as such are Wales! called on not only to show brotherly love, but to renew man's ties with nature. All his first moves were, I'm the Bishop of Buenos Aires one day, it's a big urban church with a lot of challenges. I'm the bishop of this local church, Rome, with all its challenges. I can do this. He knows how to speak to people as a pastor. Latin America as well is like the nest for populism. The narrative is we belong to the poor. We are doing everything for the poor. So if you have instead a leader that leads 1.2 billion people in the world, this is going to change the way Latin America is going to look at the church once again. Father Gustavo Carrara, parish priest of Nuestra Señora del Pueblo, likes to think... I just said to my daughter, I do some food now in a bit. I don't even make sense, guys, do I? I do some food now in a bit. That's fucking Welsh for you. That Pope Francis will embrace the farthest outposts of Christianity as leader of the Catholic Church. This present Pope used to speak of existential frontiers, by which I mean searching the frontier, which is something up, that God did. You, bro. He became incarnate not in the heart of the Roman Empire, but in the farthest reaches, in a small forgotten village that no one had ever heard about. There's a sort of return to God through Pope Francis. And this has become his mission now. So just as he would go out into the streets here, now he is going out into the world. He's a great politician. With the church in crisis, it was a wrong need for a great politician to lead it, to avoid the disaster it was going towards. The church knows. The church has archives. The church has witnesses. We ask them the to help corrupt. us. Now he's got to make a lot of choices about things he never had to think about much, so he needs the help of our prayer and support and all. He needs a lot of advice. But his biggest strength is, I think, just like every fucking elite position on this globe, a corrupt, manipulative about him or false. Corrupt. And that comes across. And that Long ends. <laughs> sacrificing to kids. Well too. In any case, the truth should never be hidden. The truth does not offend. The church is about uh, keeping alive. That's why uh, Jesus came and said he was the way Jesus and the truth. Of God Jesus and is the way and the truth. And also uh, giving hope and meaning to people. I hope even beyond the grave. And now uh, uh, people, that's good news if, 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 if it's preached and witnessed to. Witnessed to by uh, a generous and sacrificial life. This Pope, Pope Francis, is the one who I think gives more emphasis to that by his, by his personal witness. On March the 19th, 2013, Jorge Mario Bergoglio oh, was like installed as the 266th Pope and Bishop of Rome. 
Roman Catholics the world over will remember this day. Fuck off. Fucking wrong him. When he's gone, he's gone. There won't be another one. Thank fuck. Thank fuck. I got something else I want to show you guys. <laughs> While Satan is undoubtedly heading to hell, he is not currently there. While cartoons often depict Satan with a red outfit, pointed tail, and pitchfork, medieval folklore hardly represents what the Bible portrays. At the moment, Satan is not in hell. Instead, Satan roams the earth, seeking people to tempt into sin and thus separate from God. Good soldiers of Jesus Christ know Satan roams the earth, seeking those whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 8. Be sober, well-balanced, and self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. That enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. The devil! Fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour. We must be ready. Peter encourages us to remain clear-headed, sober, and watchful, vigilant because Satan has not yet been bound and restrained for 1,000 years, as Revelation 20, 1-2 says he will be. Revelation 20, 1-2 He did come into Wales one time and Taft fucking snapped his fucking jaw. And then I saw an angel descending from heaven, holding the key of the abyss, the bottomless pit, and a great chain was in his hand. And he overpowered and laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent of primeval times, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him securely for a thousand years, a millennium. Amen, Violet. At the present time, the devil walks about. He walketh about, he has access to you everywhere. He knows your feelings and your propensities, and informs himself of all your circumstances. Only God can know more and do more than he. Therefore, your care must be cast upon God. Clark The devil certainly walks about. He is a finite being and can only be in one place at one time. Yet his effort, energy and associates enable him Hiya, to Lick. extend his influence all Just over little, the world uh, and in every arena of life. We re should have waited this till tomorrow uh, to do this. It would have been better tomorrow, but hey, I got I to gotta get some pre-rugby match news out of me. So this is what this is all about, to be fair. But um, yeah, this is... Uh, uh, we've also we've looked at the church, the Vatican, and all a bunch of wrong ends how they are, and how corrupt it is. And now we're going into um, Satan, our arch enemy, um, who apparently... Is a fallen angel. Fallen. Didn't fall that far, did he? Feed like a roaring lion. Drop him like he's hard. Satan is a lion who may roar, but who has been defanged at the cross. Colosseans 2 15. When he had disarmed the rulers. I was like the entertainment, yeah. Um, yeah, cozy, put your feet up, nah. just gonna have a little slip, slide, yeah, drop some bombs. ...and authorities, those supernatural forces of evil operating against us, he made a public example of them, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphal procession, having triumphed over them through the cross. However, the sound of his roar, his deceptive lies, is still potent. Psalm 91, 3, implies Satan may come against us like a fowler who captures birds. Psalm 91, 3, For he will save you from the trap of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. Fowlers are always quiet and secretive, never wanting to reveal their presence. 2 Corinthians 11, 14, tells us that Satan can come as an angel of light, appearing glorious, reasonable, and attractive. Nevertheless, 
Peter warns us that Satan sometimes attacks like a roaring lion, loud and intimidating. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 And no wonder, since Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. We have three facts now. Number one, he roars through persecution. Never been there, like, to be honest. I hear it's a good night, nightclub now. Or, no? Get some, get some good uh, music here. Number two, he roars through strong temptation. Talk. Number three, he roars through blasphemies and accusations against God. We note Satan's goal, seeking whom he may devour. His goal isn't just to lick or nibble on his prey. He wants to devour it. He can never be content till he sees the believer utterly devoured. He would rend him in pieces and break his bones and utterly destroy him if he could. Do not, therefore, indulge the thought that the main purpose of Satan is to make you miserable. Get fucking behind me, Satan, boy. You fucking time is up. He is pleased with that, but that is not his ultimate end. Sometimes he may even make you happy, for he hath dainty poisons, sweet to the taste, which he administers to God's people. If he feels that our destruction can be more readily achieved by sweets than by bitters, he certainly would prefer that which would best affect his end. Spurgeon We read, Resist him, steadfast in the faith. The secret of spiritual warfare is straightforward, steadfast resistance. As we are firm in the faith, we resist the devil's lies and threats and intimidation. Scripture urges believers to flee from various evils, but nowhere are they advised to flee. This is quite up, guys, at the moment, because uh, I think Satan's web and, and all the demons and whatnot are, are, are everywhere at the moment. There's a lot of hate and that out there. And I'm not telling you to get fucking with Jesus or God. I'm, I'm not going to do that to you. But um, let me, I, I will say this. Satan's being beaten by a man, by a man who God sent his son. He's been beaten by him and his time is up. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Yeah. And he's going to cause now as much fuckery and hurt, hate as, as before his time is up because he knows he's, he's on the clock. End times. From the devil. That but, would be a and that's just my effort. opinion. That's my opinion. Hebert. I feel it. 1 I Corinthians feel it. 6, 18. Run away from sexual immorality in any form, whether thought or behavior, whether visual or written. Every other sin that... And, 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 and that's quite apt there now. Run away from yeah, sexual... And um, it's funny how the church, the Vatican, should bring that new law into power recently. And change, up, change up God's law. Man commits is outside the body, but the one who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. 1 Corinthians 10, 14 Therefore, my beloved, run, keep far, far away from any sort of idolatry, and that includes loving anything more than God, or participating in anything that leads to sin and enslaves the soul. 1 Timothy 6, 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee from these things. Aim at and pursue righteousness, true goodness, moral conformity to the character of God, godliness, the fear of God, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Do you hear that, guys? Love that. 2 love that. Timothy 2, 22. Run away from youthful lusts. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those believers who call on the Lord out of pure heart. Mm -hmm. The word resist comes from two ancient Greek words, stand and against. Peter tells us to stand against the devil. Satan can be set running by the resistance of the lowliest believer 
who comes in the authority of what Jesus did on the cross. Resist. Be more prayerful every time he is more active. He will soon give it up if he finds that his attacks drive you to Christ. Often has Satan been nothing but a big black dog to drive Christ's sheep nearer to the master. Spurgeon. We read, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. As we battle our spiritual battles, we are also comforted by the knowledge that we are never alone. Our brothers and sisters in Jesus have fought and are fighting the same battles. The outlook is on the whole conflict of the saints. It is seen as one. No soul is fighting alone. Each one is at once supporting and supported by all the rest. Morgan. As well as being the prince of this world. So many people have turned away. So many people have turned away, away from God. Um, atheists, atheists everywhere. And okay, it's people's choice, people's choice. But I'm telling you now, guys, I believe we're going into end days. And uh, when that shit hits the fan, when that shit hits the fan, people are going to know. People are going to know. Maybe I'll eat my words. Maybe, maybe I won't. But uh, I won't say I told you so. Satan is also the ruler of the air kingdom. John 14, 30. I will not speak with you much longer, for the ruler of the world, Satan, is coming, and he has no claim on me, no power over me, nor anything that he can use. Do this, do this, do this, very important, very important. No power over me. 30. Listen to this. I will not speak with you much longer, for the ruler of the world, Satan, is coming, and he has no claim on me, no power over me, nor anything that he can use against me. Big up, big up. Ephesians 2, 2. Love up. In which you once walked, you were following the ways of this world, influenced by this present age, in accordance with the prince of the power of the air, Satan the spirit who is now at work in the disobedient, the unbelieving, who fight against the purposes of God. Satan does not live in hell. He lives and works on the earth and in the heavens circling it. Satan is the father of lies, and he influences and rules the world right now. John 8, 44. Right now. You are of your father, the devil. And it is your will to practice the desires which are characteristic of your father. He That's was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies... Oh, you'll come back to the valleys, Kerm. I tell you, no, I snapped his fucking face. I snapped his face once and I, yeah, I haven't seen him since. You know what I mean? He speaks what is natural to him. For he is a liar and the Satan father of lies can't. and half-truths. Satan desires worship, and he uses deceit and distractions to draw man's focus to himself. Matthew 4, 9, Amplified Bible. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. The world worships Satan in one way or another, except for those who are of the kingdom of God and are therefore called out of Satan's deceptions. If a person is not a child of God, he is by... Listen up, listen up, another, another good one. Here it comes. Listen up. Satan's deceptions. If a person is not a child of God, he is, by default, a child of Satan. Big words. John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil, and it is your will to practice the desires which are characteristic of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks what is natural to him, for he is a liar and the father of lies and half-truths. Acts 13, 10 And said, You, Elamas, who are full of every kind of deceit, 
and every kind of fraud, you son of the devil, enemy of everything that is right and good. Will you never stop perverting the straight paths of the Lord? 1 John 3.10 tells us how to distinguish the two. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Oh, ye have little faith. Oh, ye have little faith. So all you've got to do is have a little faith, guys. Just a, tight, just a little drop of faith. Nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. John 3, 10. Jesus replied, You are the great and well-known teacher of Israel, and yet you do not know nor understand these things from Scripture. James 4.4 4 explains that anyone who is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. James 4.4 4, Amplified Bible You adulteresses, disloyal sinners, flirting with the world and breaking your vow to God. Do you not know that being the world's friend, that is, loving the things of the world, is being God's enemy? So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. This is important to know, because soon Jesus will return to earth Let's go, and Jesus, collect bye. what belongs to him. You, 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 he will you, you need to hurry up. You need to fucking hurry up. Feet the followers of Satan and claim his elect for himself. Ultimately, Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. Come on. This is where he knows that. Yeah, tick tock, tick tock. He knows, like, let's do a maximum uh, collateral damage. Collateral damage he's on. And tormented day and night forever and ever. He knows it. Revelation 20, 10. And the devil who had deceived them was hurled into the lake of fire and burning brimstone, sulfur where the beast, antichrist, and false prophet are also. And uh, that'll be the Pope, and Pope's before him, false prophet, yeah? I don't know who the antichrist is, I'm still looking on that one. Uh, yeah. They will be tormented day and night, forever Tick tock, ever. tick tock. Afterward, Jesus will judge unbelievers according to what they have done during their lives. Anyone whose name is not found written in the book of life is thrown into the lake of fire where Satan and his minions will be by that time. Even if it's, think of it this way, guys, even if that's not true, right? Even if that's not true, right? Which I believe it is, personally. Um, just have a little faith, a little bit of faith, like, yeah. And believe in, in, in what Jesus have said, like, and like, that's that's basically that should that should keep you keep you out of this fucking lake if it is for real like if it is for real me personally i'm not willing to take that chance i don't want to i don't want to be down there i don't want to be down there with all the wrong hands and uh uh jimmy fucking gary glitter all the cunts hitler yeah it's not good it's not going to be good down there if it's for real yeah just don't i just don't take that chance like seems as we're in end times now is that it's, it won't hurt to have a little bit of faith and put a bit of faith into something like a, like a, you call it a sky sky god sky daddy or whatever 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 but i'm telling you now there's only one man who's beaten him there's only one man who's beaten this cunt right there's only one man who has defeated satan well two when he came into the valleys i did break his jaw but jesus yeah get behind me yeah you won't go in front of me Get behind me. You're done. You're done. Pick up Jesus. Pick up Jesus, lad. Hi. Revelation 20, 13. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades, the realm of the dead, surrendered the dead who were in them. And they were judged and sentenced, every one according to their deeds. Revelation 20, 15, Amplified Bible. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was hurled into the lake of fire. Hell and death are also thrown into the lake of fire. So, technically speaking, at no time does Satan reside in hell. 
Revelation 20, 14, Amplified Bible, AMP. Then death and Hades, the realm of the dead, were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire, the eternal separation from God. The key takeaway for each person is to ensure that his own name is written in the book of life so that he may have eternal life in heaven rather than eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. In Job 1, we read that he had access to God's presence. Now there was a day when the sons of God, angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, adversary, accuser, also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Then Satan answered the Lord, from roaming around on the earth and from walking around on it. Definitely one whales. Job 1. In Revelation 12, the devil and his demons march in heaven and make a heavenly conflict. Revelation 12, 7 to 9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael, the archangel, and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought. But they were not strong enough and did not prevail, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the age-old serpent who is called the devil and Satan, he who continually deceives and seduces the entire inhabited world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. The archangel Michael was God's champion, the commanding general of God's forces. As a result, the dragon and his minions are cast down to the ground, and he loses his position. The one who deceives the whole world, the devil, Satan, is the one John refers to as the great dragon, that serpent of old. After this battle, Satan is judged and tormented forever. Done. Revelation 12, 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom, dominion, reign of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our believing brothers and sisters has been thrown down at last. He who accuses them and keeps bringing charges of sinful behavior against them before our God day and night. Even so, believers have a divine advocate before God named Jesus Christ. Yeah, my man. 1 John 2 1 My little children, believers, dear ones, I am writing you these things so that you will not sin and violate God's law. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate who will intercede for us with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, the upright, the just one, who conforms to the Father's will in every way. Purpose, thought, Shit, I and go, action. I got goosebumps. That's mad. Satan, the adversary, may seek to destroy God's people, but Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good Me too, and I like, I like the sheep. Shepherd lays down his own life for the sheep. Come on. John 10, 14. I am the good shepherd, and I know, without any doubt, those who are my own and my own know me and have a deep personal relationship with me. Satan will lose the conflict and be cast to earth, and his angels will be cast out with him. John then offers a simple strategy believers through the ages have employed to overcome Satan's attacks, a threefold plan against the devil's assaults covering, confession, and courage. First, the Christian's covering is nothing less than Christ's blood, spilled for his or her sin. Apart from the blood of Christ, a person remains forever vulnerable to Satan. Second, the Christian's confession is the word of God. Recall Jesus' successful defense against the devil's temptations yes. was entirely due to his use of God's word. Yes, yes. Third, the Christian's courage 
is indicated by loving Jesus more than life. They did not love their lives to the death. Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame and conquered him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. For they did not love their life and renounce their faith even when faced with death. Satan never sleeps, nor does he tire in his repeated attack. No, you so don't either. That's funny, isn't it? Yeah. Attacks on God's people. Well, apparently, uh, he saw he's, he's out to get me again, and uh, uh, I don't know what I don't know. Yeah, he's taken war, he's, he's, he's claimed war on Taff again. Poor boy. Poor boy. Yeah, just don't, we won't give him no ammo this time, in there. Yeah. Little fucking little demon. Christians who think this spiritual warfare is a good subject to discuss, but don't think it affects their lives every day may be vulnerable to spiritual defeat. Spiritual war, guys. We're literally in a spiritual war. I shit you not, we are in a spiritual war. And um, just to close this up now and now, because uh, this is, this is uh, why I believe we're in end days. Just to, just to give you a little insight to what I'm talking about. Let's go with this. The Bible, the Holy Bible, 66 books with two distinct sections, 39 Old Testament books and 27 New Testament books. The story of the New Testament canon is a fascinating one. There are books that were accepted very quickly, almost from the start. For instance, the four gospels. And there are other books that struggled to get in, for instance, 2 Peter. And then there is the book of Revelation, the final book of the Bible, the Apocalypse of John. Few today would contest the claim that the book of Revelation stands as one of the most controversial, complicated, and misunderstood books in the New Testament. Perhaps it should come as no surprise, then, that its reception by the early church was equally complicated and controversial. No other book was more contested to be in the canon of Scripture other than the book of Revelation. But there is a blessing that is unique only to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Are you ready? Are you ready for the throne room of heaven to witness the living creatures, each having six wings that do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come? Are you ready for the Lamb to take the scroll and to begin to open the seals, marking the commencement of the judgment of God? Are you ready for the four horsemen of Apocalypse to make their cosmic descent upon the earth? A rider on a black horse, a rider on a white horse, a rider on a pale horse, and a rider on a red horse? Are you ready for the sixth seal to be opened and for the cosmic disturbance, for the sun to become black and the moon to turn into blood, and for the stars of heaven to fall to the earth? If you think about it, there's been a lot of blood moons, guys. Been a lot of blood moons. Just a note. Are you ready for the 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel to be sealed? Are you ready for the prelude to the seven trumpets where there will be 30 minutes of silence in heaven? I just heads up, there's been trumpets too. People have been hearing fucking strange noises all over the planet. Trumpets, yeah, sounding off randomly. 30 minutes of anticipation as the wrath of God is about to be unleashed without limit. During those 30 minutes, every angel, every saint that has ever lived will be in awe for what is about to happen. Are you ready for the seven angels with seven trumpets to sound? Are you ready for the first trumpet to sound where the vegetation will be struck? Are you ready for the second, 
third and fourth trumpet Let's to go. sound and to see an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice woe 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 to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound are you ready for the angel that will open up the bottomless pit and that will allow Abaddon, Apollyon the destroyer, to descend into the earth with his locusts? Are you ready for the angels from the Euphrates to be released? Are you ready for the arrival of the two? Euphrates River is dried up. Euphrates River is dried up. Witnesses for them to preach and then to be martyred All and signs. then for them to be All resurrected signs. and then ascend to heaven in a cloud Are you ready for the rise of the Antichrist and the mark of the beast? Are you ready mark for the, the three angels to be sent down to the earth to come and preach the gospel? Are you ready for the seven bowls of judge storms floods? Volcanoes Earth cracking earthquakes are you ready for the heavens to open to see a rider on the right horse and the rider on that horse is none other than Jesus eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns are you ready for a new heaven and the new earth are you ready to see the holy city new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband Signs are Today, we are going to focus on the second section of the book of Revelation, the Great Tribulation and the Second Coming. The Bible and Jesus told us that there will be a Great Tribulation on Earth such that has never been recorded before. The Antichrist will come into power. And what will mark the beginning of the Great Tribulation is not the Rapture, but it will be when the Antichrist signs a covenant with Israel for seven years. However, the Antichrist will break the covenant halfway through the seven years. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 gives us further insight. It reads, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. The Antichrist will commit the abomination of desolation and set up an image of himself to be worshipped. Those who are alive and remain during the tribulation should be watchful and recognize that this event is the beginning of three and a half years of the worst of the tribulation period and that the return of the Lord Jesus is imminent. Come on. The Antichrist is going to enforce the worship of the beast by making life unbearable for those who try to refuse to accept the mark of the beast and those who... And what's life like at the moment? It's getting unbearable, guys. Not to be a downy down down there, but his life is getting like, oh, we're just shaking our heads all the time. Come on, just admit it. You've got to admit it to yourself. Even if you, I'm going to faith, you're just shaking your head all the time, thinking, what the fuck, like, what the fuck is going on, like, yeah? What the fuck's going on, like? Well, we were warned. Refuse to worship it. Revelations chapter 13, verses 16 through 17 says, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. During the Great Tribulation, the activities of the four horsemen of the apocalypse will be done on earth. Also, the seven seals of God will be opened, the seven trumpets of God will be blown, and the seven bowls of God's wrath will be poured out on the inhabitants of the earth. As each of the seven seals of God was opened, John saw events that took place on earth. As soon as the first seal was opened, John saw the first horseman riding a white horse, and he had a bow in his hand and a crown on his head. He was given the power to go forth and conquer the entire earth. The opening of the second seal revealed a rider on a red horse, who was given a great sword and the power to take peace away from the earth. At the opening of the third seal, John saw a black horse, whose rider had a pair of balances in his hand, and the rider of the horse was commanded not to hurt the oil and the wine. John saw a pale horse when the fourth seal was opened, and the rider of the horse was death, and hell followed after him. Death was given the power to kill with sword, 
with hunger, with death, and with wild beasts one-fourth of the dwellers of the earth. After the fifth seal was opened, John was granted to see the souls of saints which had been slain for the word of God, and the testimony of God which they upheld. And they were given white robes that they should rest until their brethren which are left in the world are martyred like they were. The opening of the sixth seal caused a great earthquake on earth. The sun became as black as... I can't fucking, I can't like um, give you any more sort of like tips or heads up. Blah. Just, just have a think to yourself, right? Of like, put, put, put faith aside, put faith aside, and look at the state of the planet. Look at the state of people. Look, look, look where we're going, right? Look where we're going and what's happening. Yeah, it's it's all falling apart, guys. It's all falling apart. Just read the book of Revelations. Just read the book of Revelations, and it'll give you that insight to exactly where we are in the book of revelations and how far we are down the line of end times sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood the stars wormwood. of heaven fell from their heights and great was the shaking of the heavens and the this is wormwood this is wormwood with uh nibiru what i've been talking about this is what this is all about nibiru in the bible is called wormwood yeah with the stars they said the stars fell to earth that's 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 asteroids has to fall out of Nibiru and that sort and that system. This is the this is that. Yeah. And it'll be too late then. It'll be too late. The earth that even heaven was folded up. At this point, the people on earth began to look for safety. Revelation chapter six, verses sixteen through seventeen says, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? All these things are a chip of an iceberg compared to what will happen on earth when the seven trumpets are blown and the seven bowls of the wrath of God are poured out against the earth. Prior to this happening, the church would have been raptured. I'm not saying that, John. I'm saying trust in your own instinct, trust in your own feelings, trust in, 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 in your self-belief. That, that you've got in it. Use your mind, use your knowledge, logic, and uh, look at look where, where we are. Look at what, what it was like when we was like little grasshoppers at 10 years old, yeah, to what it is now. Look, look just, just fucking think about it, like. The Return of the Lord. Revelation 19, verse 11 to 21. And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. At the end of the great tribulation, Christ will return in his glory to destroy the Antichrist and his armies and cast them into the lake of fire. The second coming of Christ will be very much different from his first advent. In his first time, Christ came as a sacrificial lamb for sin, but at his second coming, he will appear as a lion to judge the wickedness of nations and to conquer the entire world and restore peace to the people of God. Christ will return with a host of heaven on white horses. Jude 1 verse 14 to 15 and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. The prophecy of Enoch, the seventh from Adam, and the prophecy of the Apostle Paul, and the prophecy of John the Revelator, all align to tell us of the second coming of the Lord Jesus and his saints. Who is this one that is described to be coming with all his saints? 
He is revealed in the book of Revelation. Revelation 1 verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. The whole Bible reveals Jesus Christ to us, but no book quite reveals him to us like the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ wants his church to know who he is, because the only way to the Father is through him. If you come through any other way, you come in as a thief and a robber. The Lord Jesus Christ is revealed in the book of Revelation. He is revealed in Revelation 1 verse 18. I am the living one. I was dead and now look. I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. He is the risen king, the living one. He is no longer coming as a baby. He is no longer on the cross. He is no longer in the grave. But he is the living one who has the keys of death and Hades, the Almighty. He is revealed in Revelation 19 verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True and in righteousness he doth judge. He is revealed in Revelation 22 verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. This means it all started with him and it will all consummate with him. Our human minds cannot comprehend that, that he has always been here. In eternity past he was here forever here, before anything was created, he was here. Before the earth, before the universe, before the angels were created, the Lord Jesus Christ was here. And it is this Lord Jesus that Enoch speaks of returning with his saints. Revelation 19 verse 15 says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Finally, the wrath of God would be satisfied when his judgment and justice have found expression on earth. Rapture is real. Heaven is real. Hell is real. The Great Tribulation is real and the Second Coming of Christ is real. If the trumpet should sound now, are you sure you will not be left behind? Matthew 7, 21 through 23, King James Love Version. Me. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. This passage of Scripture is focused on believers. This passage of Scripture tells us that there will be some people who are surprised on the Day of Judgment. Who exactly are these people who will be surprised? They are the people who attended church. They are the people who watched videos like this. They are the people who claim to be children of God. And what the Bible tells us is that they will be surprised by the things that will happen on the Day of Judgment. The truth is, what really matters in salvation is not one's prayer you made 20 years ago. Salvation is not a mere verbal confession, and it is not spiritual works. Listen up, people. Listen salvation up. is not prophesying, neither is it casting out devils. But salvation is knowing knowing the one and only way to God the Father. Salvation is knowing Jesus and being known by Him. That is salvation at its core. Amen. Salvation is not connection with your church congregation. It is not a connection with your pastor. Salvation is our connection to Jesus Christ. Faith is something God can produce in you through the Holy Spirit. So it is God. It matters not to you, John. It matters not to you. Yeah. Maybe one day 
that'll change. Maybe one day it'll change. That's all I got to say. God, who opens your eyes to his grace and gives you the means to have faith. This may surprise you, oh, but the truth faith. is, belief without following oh, the Lord Jesus Christ is simply belief. Anyone can believe in God intellectually. There are plenty of people out there who believe and know there is a God and hate Him. A perfect example of these types of people, or should I say spirits, are Satan and his demons. James 2.19 You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. There is a massive difference in someone saying, I believe in God, and someone living out their salvation. The Bible is clear that we must believe, and we must follow. Anybody can say they walk in the light. I, we're all light beings, yeah? But the light walking in the light is not enough. Because if, if, forgive me if, if, if I'm not wrong, wasn't, wasn't Satan the, the light bearer? Satan was the light bearer. It's just not enough. It's only through Jesus. It's only through Jesus. Yeah, um, that's that's the main emphasis here. Just have that little faith, just a tiny bit of faith. Just a bit of faith. But in order to follow, we must first be saved. Church attendance is not what will make you known by Jesus. Jesus said, Not everyone who calls him Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Just take a look at that statement. That is a shocking statement. This is something for us to think about. This is a big deal. This is not a joke at all. Imagine going to church all the time and you ending up in hell. This is a serious matter. Are you one of those people Jesus is referring to? I pray that you are not. Will you be surprised on the day of judgment? This is the truth coming out to you. This is a very difficult message to listen to, but it is still the truth. Jesus said, calling him Lord doesn't even mean he knows you. Even demons called Jesus Lord when they met him in the Bible. Look at this interaction between Jesus and the demoniac of Gadara. Luke 8, 26 through to 28. Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there he met him, a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. John, I don't think you need to walk with him. I just think it, you just need to be heard by him. Yeah, and 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 with all in in sincerity, was yeah, if that's the right word. Yeah. So when you when you talk, and you want to get that connection, yeah, you mean it. Like, say it. Say it like you mean it. Say it with your chest. That's just, 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 just the way I, way I am anyway. Yeah. There's, there's, there's dodgy paths everywhere, John, everywhere, and I, but that's, that's the, that's the deception, that's, that's what Satan's, that's what Satan's like, leading you down. Just gotta believe in one man, one man, and put all your faith in one man. It's not a lot. It's not. It's not. It's not even a lot to ask. It's not even a lot to ask. Yeah, for a man who, who, who died on the cross for us, so we could all live in sin. It's, 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 it's just fucking common sense. It's simple. It's fucking simple. Yeah. But what this video is about is going to church and being a part-time Christian uh, is, is basically not enough. It's, it's, it's like um, being a plastic, it's like being a plastic Christian. Hey, we're gonna go down roads in throughout our life. Uh, like they, you know what I mean, we that's life, isn't it? That is life, but but you've got to learn from them and 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 then move forward. What to what you think is is the better path? Choose the better path.
Yeah, we all make mistakes. That's life. That's fucking life. That is just life. Because we're, we're humans at the end of the day, right? Time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I done with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Oh, so John, you do believe there is a heaven then? Is that what you're saying? Because if it's an heaven, then there's definitely a hell. I know, and I know where I want to be going. I beg you, do not torment me. Look at what these demons speaking through this man referred to Jesus as. They said, Jesus, Son of the Most High God. Jesus said that many people... People will come to him and say they have prophesied. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You didn't hear me then. So if you believe in heaven, you've got to believe in hell because it's like the yin and the yang. You can't have one without the other. They literally can't be one without the other. As above, so below. As in his name. Many will say they have preached in his name. Many will say they have performed miracles in his name. Many will say they have big churches and branches around the world. Many will say they helped people. But Jesus will say he doesn't know them. Wow. This is something very heavy. This is something you don't want to hear. This is something you don't want to happen to you. Jesus will tell them to depart. These are the three scariest words you never want to hear. Depart from me. Do you want to hear this? After all the church attendance, after all the prayers you have prayed, do you want to be part of those who will hear this from Jesus? Do you want to be called a worker of iniquity? Do you want to be rejected and denied on the day of judgment? Jesus will say to them, Depart. If you don't want Jesus to tell you to depart, there is something you must do, and it is to do the will of God. You need to do the will of God. The will of God for your life is to come unto repentance. The will of God for your life is for you not to cover up your mistakes, but confess them. The will of God for your life is that you accept the free gift of salvation. I must be clear, you cannot earn or work your way into heaven. Ephesians 2, 8 For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Accepting the free gift of God will develop a connection with the one way to God. Now, how can I make sure that on the day of judgment, Jesus Christ does not say these words to me? Depart from me. The simple answer is abide in Christ, and He will abide in you. He will be with you and make you yield good fruits. Simples. John 15, 4 through to 6. Abide in me, and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, Listen except up. it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in Christ, you will never wither, you will never be cut down and thrown in hell. Abide in Christ, and follow Him. To abide in Christ is to have an intimate, 
close relationship with Jesus, so that you may know Him and He may know you, not just a superficial acquaintance on Sunday alone. To abide in Christ is living each day for Him. To abide in Christ is when Jesus Christ is your everything. To abide in Christ is not holding your salvation on anything you have ever done, but holding your salvation on His finished work on the cross. Abiding in Christ is taught in 1 John 2, 4 through to 6. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, King James Version. Wherefore seeing, we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witness. Let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look unto Jesus. Look unto him and not any other thing. While going to church, look to Jesus. While praying, look to Jesus. In everything you do, always look unto Jesus. Don't take your eyes off of him. Focus on Jesus. You need to follow God and follow Him always. God doesn't want you to perish. He doesn't I agree, John. The kingdom is within. want you to end badly. He wants you to repent. This is just His will for your life. He wants you to live in holiness. He wants you to do the right thing. 2 Peter 3, 9 King James Version. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Live in holiness. Hebrews 12, 14, King James Version. Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Beautiful, beautiful. As Jesus says, it is done. It is done. Okay. Last one, last one. This is Arthur, and Arthur only has days left to live. But what you need to know about Arthur is that he absolutely loved peppermints. In fact, everywhere he went, he used to take a large big jar of peppermints so he could eat them all day long. Well, very sadly, in Arthur's final moments of life, he looked at his wife and he said to her, You have been a marvellous wife. But would you do just one last favour for me? Would you take my jar of peppermints and would you put them right at the very top of the attic so that when I die, when I rise up to heaven, I can grab my jar and take it to be with me for all of eternity? Anyway, a few months later, after Arthur had passed away, his wife again was in the attic and she was going through some of his things. And there in front of her, something caught her eye. It was the jar of peppermints. She picked it up, <sighs> blew the dust off it and then said these words out loud. Oh boy, I knew I should have put them in the basement instead. You see, my dear friends, my fear is this. Some people who watch my videos believe that they are going up, but the reality is they're actually going down to hell.
So today, I'm going to share with you three scary signs that a person is probably going to hell. But there is something absolutely crucial you also need to know, and it's this. One of these signs is more deadly than all of them put together. And I want to see if you can guess which of these signs is the most potent out of the three before I reveal the answer. Number one, you're obsessed with the things of this world. I believe the most terrifying word in the whole of the Bible is this word remember. Did you know Jesus told a parable that was actually true? He talked about a rich man and a poor man called Lazarus. This rich man was clothed in the most expensive clothing. He lived in a mansion. He lived in utter luxury every day. But the poor man, Lazarus, begged at his gate. He led down. He was covered in sores. And he longed. He longed for the food that fell from the rich man's table. He just wanted a few crumbs just to try and satisfy this aching hunger he had. But eventually both men died. The rich man went down to hell, but the poor man, Lazarus, went to heaven because he loved the Lord. And in hell, the rich man cried out. Did you know this, that people cry out in hell? People pray in hell, but it's too late. There's no hope. This rich man cried out, Oh, Father Abraham, would you send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in a pool of water and put it on the tip of my tongue because I am in utter Amen. torment Amen. in the flames God. of this fire? Amen. But Abraham replied these two words, Amen. Son, remember, remember. You see, my dear friends, there will be no memory loss in hell. You will remember every time you rejected the preacher. You will remember every time that you chose your own ways over the ways of God. You will remember every time you drove past a church when you knew the gates were open, you knew that the doors were open to come and hear about the saving message of Jesus Christ, but you rejected it. You will remember every time someone tried to put a gospel leaflet in your hand to tell you about salvation through Christ alone. And you will be haunted with this memory for all of eternity. Why didn't I repent? Why didn't I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, it would be super easy for us to rush to a silly conclusion that always the rich people go to hell because they're evil and the poor people always go to heaven. But that simply isn't the case. You see, Abraham, who the rich man was calling out to, Abraham was one of the wealthiest people who ever walked on this earth and yet he was in paradise. He was in comfort. And I don't want to upset anyone, but there will also be many many poor people who will end up in hell. The point is this, it depends where your treasure is. Are you so grounded in this earth that you don't care about the things of God? Because that's what the problem with the rich man was. He ignored that poor man who stood outside his gate and begged and he was too concerned with self and the things of this life. In my country we have some eco-warriors called Insulate Britain. Do you know what they do? They run in front of the busiest roads in the Fuck no, uh yeah, good afternoon, pick a mix. No, I didn't, bro. Well, but what magnitude is it? I didn't feel nothing, no. Maybe maybe it was like North North Wales or something. It's interesting. I'll have a look at that. UK and they pull out their banners and they glue themselves to the road to cause a big build-up of traffic and thus draw lots of attention to their campaign. Now why is this so frustrating? Because when the police come and they try to budge them, they can't move these people because their hands and their feet are glued to the road. And my dear friend, I believe there are many people who profess to be Christians but their hands are glued to the things of this earth. So suppose the Lord Jesus Christ was to come right now and he was to call all of his saints to meet him in the sky and they would rise up. Many of these same people yeah, would cuts, have their uh, hands glued to their laptops cuts, and all the filth on them. there. They would have their hands glued God to their bless. cars, to their career, to their social media platforms, to their houses. They would not want to rise up with the Lord Jesus Christ. They would not move because like the Apostle Paul said about Demas, they have fallen in love with the things of this present age. Are you ready when the Lord Jesus Christ comes and he says rise? Mercer, fucking Mercer, 3.8, Jesus Christ. Christ. Mirtha, that's only 12 mile away. 12 mile. Nah, I didn't feel nothing, bro. What time? Do you know what time? Come with me to heaven and let's build a new kingdom. Or are you quite content with the devil's kingdom and the things of this world? So, over to... Because we did have something similar, maybe about, um, maybe about eight, ten years ago. And that, that literally, that, that woke me out of bed. 
They all woke me out of bed. And it was about a three pound something it was. Literally shook me out of bed. And I and I and I rose to um uh, the baby and, and, and my ex cry crying they were. But yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I th but I, that was down, they put that down to fracking down in Swansea. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, big up more flood. Come on, boys. Come on. Do you, do you think number one is the most concerning sign that you're probably going to hell? Well, we're going to find out very shortly. Number two, you think that you are a good person. I hope this doesn't happen to you, but suppose tonight is your last night on planet Earth and you stand before the creator of this universe and he says to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would your answer be? Would you say, because I'm a good person? Would you say, because I'm a churchgoer? Would you say, because I've done religious things? If any of those things were your answer, I don't want to upset anyone but I've got to tell you this I truly do believe that the Lord would turn around to you and say these words depart from me I never knew you for anyone who thinks that they're a good person did you know the Lord Jesus Christ said these very words no one is good except God alone we've told lies and the Bible says all liars will have their part in the lake yeah, of I don't know what that means but I, I like it fire we've been proud at times and it says in the bible that god resists the proud every single oh, one of us has I committed know, adultery know. in our hearts we've totally looked with wrong it. desires at someone I who is not our husband or our wife and the bible it. says that no adulterer no fornicator will have any inheritance in the kingdom of god but here's the amazing news there is a wideness to god's yeah, mercy even though we are criminals in the sight of god god does allow criminals into his heaven but they have to be cleaned up criminals how does it work well because the god of the universe loved the people that he created he cared for them he looks at them and says i've made you i love you i want you to be in heaven with me this same god prepared a sacrifice he gave up his precious son his only son the very jewel of heaven and he gave him as a gift to this broken sinful world and did you know this one of the most incredible mind-boggling things is the god of this universe christ jesus spirit stepped into a human body and he lived amongst us. He wasn't born in a palace in Rome. He was born in a little animal trough in a little meager town called Bethlehem. He didn't hang around with celebrities, but rather tax collectors and fishermen. He didn't have a, a glamorous job in the Houses of Parliament. No, the Lord Jesus Christ, he worked with stone and wood. He lived a very humble life and didn't seek after the elaborate things. And everywhere this man went, he left light. He healed the sick. He fed the poor. He had compassion on the lost. And it said about him that the common people heard him gladly. And this wonderful person, God in a flesh, willingly laid down his life to save you and I. He was put on a cross, and there on the cross... I think we could we could do with Jesus playing like Scrum Half today or something like that, you know what I mean? <laughs> Come on. My saviour died for you. He had nails driven through his hands and his feet. He had a crown of thorns smashed into his skull. He was spat on, he was beaten, he was mocked, and everyone was there pointing at him saying, him, look at him, the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, bring yourself down from the cross. He endured the shame of the cross, being punished, laughed at, so that you and I could be forgiven. But you know, the worst bit was, and I can't put it into words, but there was this sense of everything that we've done wrong, all of our lies, all of our sin, all of the times that we've said, OMG, all of the times we've been lustful and proud, all the violence of the world, was at some point, it was pressured into one moment. It was laid, it was encased in Christ's body, and there he was tormented there he was punished he endured the wrath of God so that you and I can be let off can be forgiven and can be cleansed because the blood of Jesus Christ can wash away all of our sins one drop would wash away the most vilest sinner one drop half a drop can make the most wicked person totally clean in God's eyes why because the Son of God's blood is so precious and my dear friends I've got to ask you right now are you trusting in that sacrifice are you trusting trusting in the Son of God, Jesus Christ alone? Or are you trusting in your own good works? Before Jesus Christ breathed his last breath, he said these three words, it is, is finished. Dead. What did he mean by that? He was saying, dead. the price has been paid. I have given a sacrifice. The door is open again. and it's a wide door of God's mercy.
mercy. And anyone who will humble themselves, anyone who will repent and leave behind their old ways and seek after the forgiveness of God, anyone who will walk through this wide door and enter in will find eternal life on the other side. So, over to you again. Do you think that number two is the most dangerous sign that you might just be going to hell? Well, we're going to find out in just a moment's time. The third sign that you might just be going to hell is that there is no fruit in your life. Jesus once rebuked the Pharisees and Sadducees, saying this, And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. One of the first sermons I ever wrote was entitled this, Jesus and his axe. You know, we often sing a song and it goes like this, Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. And I truly do believe that. The Lord Jesus Christ really is a gentle, loving Saviour. But never forget this. He's also a man that you never ever want to mess with. There's a reason why the demons tremble when you say the name the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a reason why yeah. the devil is a defeated foe. There's a reason yeah. why the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who death could not hold him down. He conquered the grave because there is power in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this might shock some of you, but Jesus Christ has an axe. And that axe is laid at the root of the tree of your life. And Christ is waiting to see if you will bear fruit because the trees that don't bear fruit will be cut down and will be cast into the fire. Okay, Joe, I get exactly what you're trying to say. I just need to do more good works and then Jesus won't cut down my tree. Well, actually, no, that's the mistake that the Pharisees and the Sadducees made. They thought if they can put on an outward show, if they can manufacture their own good works, well, then they'll be acceptable to God. But God looked at the inside, inside of them. They were like whitewashed tombs. There was deadness and iniquity inside of them. What you and I need instead is for the Holy Spirit to do a work of regeneration where we bear fruit through him. You see, when a man or a woman puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and he dwells in these earthen vessels. That's an amazing truth that here is the God of the universe and he lives inside of us. And when he comes, he doesn't just leave us as we were. It is impossible to meet the living God, to have an encounter with the living God and to go through life unchanged. No, once the Holy Spirit is inside you, he convicts you of sin. He points you and he conforms you and takes off the rough edges to make you more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And over time, you will bear fruit because the Holy Spirit is doing a work of regeneration through you. Okay, the fruit might be small at times, the fruit might be unimpressive, but in the life of a true believer, there will always be fruit. Jesus Christ said, by their fruits, you shall know them. And you can tell that there is a believer in front of you because they will bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit. They'll have a sensitivity to sin. They'll have a longing above everything else to know Jesus Christ, to be more closer to him. They'll have a desire to to know more about the Word of God. They'll have more self-control than they used to have in their previous life. And oh my dear precious brother, my dear precious sister, how you and I need to be crying out to God daily saying, Lord God, help me to bear fruit. Let the Holy Spirit do a work through me, shape me, mold me. You are the potter and I am the clay. Do something through me because this is simply not a work that we can conjure up ourselves. We need him to work through us. So I'll ask you one more time. What do you think out of these three signs is the most dangerous sign that a person might be going to hell? Well, it's not number three, it's actually number two. In regards to number one and number three, I do want you to seriously, if these are in your life, I really do want you to pray seriously and seek the Lord's face that you might not be a Christian, but I do believe that some Christians will struggle with these things. But number two is not negotiable. If you are resting in your own good works, if you are resting in your own righteousness, you will not make it to heaven and you are heading to hell. For by grace you have been saved, through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It is only Jesus Christ who can save a drowning man. You can rest in your own swimming abilities, but eventually the torrents of the ocean will drag you down and they'll take you to hell. But my dear friends, there is a saviour who reaches out his hand and says, grab onto it. I'll save you. I'm a stronger swimmer than you are and I'm going to take you to paradise, to heaven, for all of eternity. Have you taken his hand? Have you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay. Okay. 
So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it there, guys. And uh, I think that's a good place to end it. Um, blessings. Thank you, everybody. Come. And, uh, John, big up, John. Everybody, thank you. And uh, as Jesus said, it is finished. And as Taffy says, come on, Wales. Come on, Wales. You what's it? Beat them English today. Come on. Love you guys. Out. <laughs>